Al Walters. I'm the president of the History Museum. Hello, people on Zoom. Glad you're here with us, too. Uh, and I, for one, am glad to be back in person here for a, a, uh, the brown bag lunch for the first time in a year plus. I'm glad to see friendly faces. Um, one word about museum policy regarding masks, our, our rule we recently changed. If, if you are fully vaccinated, you do not have to wear a mask. If you are not fully vaccinated, we ask you to wear a mask and we'll leave it at that. One piece of <clears throat> important upcoming business, the Nancy Kimball Cobblestone Open House is tomorrow. No, it's not. We won't be ready tomorrow. Still house clean to be done. It'll be Saturday. It turns out when you invite people over to your house, you have to clean your house, uh, or so my wife tells me. Um, from one to three on Saturday, the cobblestone will be an open house. You're invited. Whenever it was at the last time you were at the house, a lot has changed since then, I assure you. We're on the home stretch. Come and see it. One to three, 302 West Chicago. With that out of the way, let's get on with today's program. Our guest speaker today is Tom Armstrong, be the just a gentleman right to my left. Tom is a longtime Elginite, uh, having come to Elgin to work for the city of Elgin in 1981 and had a long career with them as a city planner. There's a chance you might live on a street he helped plan. Um, in addition to um, working hard for the city of Elgin, turns out Tom likes to ride bicycles and he's gonna tell us about it. Tom? Actually, uh, I, I think I know most of the people in this room and I'm pretty certain that I didn't plan any of your streets because they predated my time uh, here in Elgin and uh, as well as, uh, you know, people um, that are watching remotely here. So I, I see one of my neighbor's names on, on the screen here. So. I retired from working with the city of Elgin way back in 2009. It doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but holy cow, time flies. Um, and um, that summer, actually a couple of weeks before I retired, I got uh, contacted by a friend of mine who was the uh, executive director for uh, the League of Illinois Bicyclists. Um, and he said that they were going to hire two people in Elgin to safety classes all summer. And they said, you know, and we spent the whole summer right in the streets of Elgin, uh, teaching bicycle safety classes to kids from six or seven years old up to kids 80, 85 years old, uh, the Golden Ks, because they had a bicycle club. So uh, that was kind of my real uh, introduction into cycling um, around Elgin. But Elgin has uh, a long uh, storied history uh, involving the bicycle. So Tom Ambrose um, uh, authored this really interesting book called The History of Cycling and 50 Bikes. And um, he's quoted as saying, for an, it, an invention that has only been around for 200 years, the simple bicycle has changed the world in many ways. It democratized transport for the first time, allowing ordinary people to travel to, at reasonable speeds without need of a horse to commute further afield for work and to enjoy the benefits of the countryside. Bikes challenged social conventions, granting women a newfound freedom and played an important role in theaters of war, the world wars, the Korean war, even the Vietnam war. Uh, today, despite the prevalence of the car, the bicycle is as important as ever with more cycles appearing on city streets each year. So the, the very first um, bike was something called the Cellar Affair, and it was developed and uh, invented in France in 1791. It was an interesting contraption, it had no pedals, no handlebars, no steering, it was made entirely of wood, and was propelled uh, with the rider's feet, so kind of like a kid's spider bike today. Um, 
you know, he wanted to change direction. He had to pick the bike up and turn it and uh, move it, move it uh, in, the, in the new direction. And they were very heavy. That was followed in 1817 uh, by the invention of the Lauf Machina. Um, my better half helped me with the pronunciation of that. And that was invented in Germany in 1817. Um, similar to the Cellafrere, um, it was a running machine. So you propelled it with your feet on the ground. Again, no pedals, no handlebars, but it did have a steering bar, kind of like a, a joystick in, a, in some airplanes. It was made of wood, um, the wheels were wood, uh, but they were banded with iron uh, as for a tire. And again, propelled by feet on the ground. Um, so uh, people were working to improve this vehicle um, all over Europe in particular. So Germany, England, France, um, a gentleman in France uh, introduced the Velocipede in 1863. Uh, it was also known, commonly referred to as the bone shaker. Uh, this bicycle is a little different in that it was propelled by a crank and pedals attached to the front wheel. So the front wheel could turn and you, you pedal, pedaled, uh, powered that front wheel kind of like a, a modern day tricycle. Um, it had a steel frame and again, wood wheels with steel tires. So you can imagine the condition of roads back in 1863, knowing that this thing is made out of steel, um, why it's called the bone shaker. The next improvement um, was the ordinary, which was embedded in England in 1870. It's also known as the aerial or the penny farthing the high wheel bikes. Um, and that was basically built and uh, designed because there was a need for speed. Um, people were getting into bicycle racing and they were looking for ways to go faster. So this large wheel with cranks attached to it, you can imagine one, one revolution of uh, the pedal stroke, you're covering quite a bit of ground pretty, pretty quickly. It was the most iconic uh, design of bikes uh, developed in the 19th century, but there was a greater risk of injury. So you hit a branch or a big rock or something on a road. Uh, this is where the phrase taking a header was coined from. Um, taking a spill over the handlebars um, on a penny farthing. That was followed uh, by the invention of the safety bike in England in 1885. Um, and that's characterized by equal size wheels. The drive chain um, on this bike was attached to the rear wheel. Um, so allowing easier ease of steering. Um, and uh, uh, there was an ease of pedaling, which led, led to uh, a re reduced risk and more people of all ages and genders uh, riding this bike for both recreation and transportation. So this was 1885. That's really the start of what was referred to as a golden age of cycling, which lasted about 15 to 20 years um, in the late 1800s. So we've got a little, uh, let's see if I can pull this up here.
Benny Goodman, as my parents danced to the uh, Benny Goodman band at the uh, dance hall in Medota. That's where they, where they met. So the golden age of cycling, uh, bicycle manufacturers were popping up by the hundreds, by the thousands around the world. And um, Elgin was no different. Um, there were actually five bicycle manufacturers in Elgin. Jeff White. Um, so Jeff and I have been talking about this subject for many years. And for, for a long time, uh, we understood that there were four manufacturers in Elgin. Then he found a fifth one. And he shared that information with me and I inserted it into my presentation years ago. And that presentation disappeared on my computer somewhere. So uh, Jeff's not here. So I, I need to talk to him again and uh, refresh my memory. Uh, but um, these four uh, manufacturers um, started in Elgin in the um, mid um, 1880s um, and lasted a very short time. The three um, uh, most successful of, of these manufacturers were the Elgin Cycle Company, CH Woodruff Company, and the Elgin Sewing Machine and Bicycle Company. So CH Woodruff Company was, so all of these companies basically opened up in the same year. Um, C.H. Woodruff was the first, um, and uh, of course, C.H. Woodruff was a foundry on uh, State Street and Kimball. Um, and so they operated um, the bicycle manufacturing um, out of a building on, on that property uh, along State Street. The Elgin Cycle Company was a subsidiary of the o Illinois Watch Case Company. Um, which was located on uh, Dundee Avenue and Slade. Um, people are probably most familiar with Simpson Electric, which was the last, last occupant of those buildings. Um, so uh, Illinois Watch Case Company actually built an addition onto their building for their bicycle manufacturing operations and had actually had a test track on the property uh, behind, that, behind that building. Um, the Elgin Sewing Machine and Bicycle Company um, was the newest um, manufacturer to come into Elgin. They actually relocated from Arlington Heights to Elgin. Um, all of these uh, companies, so, you know, they opened up in the mid 18 uh, in the mid um, 1880s, and by the end of the 1890s, they were all out of business. Um, there's something called this motorized vehicle. I think people were starting to play around with and uh, interest in bicycling uh, quickly waned um, and it was uh, the businesses were losing proposition. So, so the um, uh, companies closed. I wanna talk a little bit more about the Elgin Sewing Machine and Bicycle Company. Like I said, they moved to Elgin uh, from Arlington Heights um, in um, 1895, uh, the manufacturing plant was heavily damaged by a tornado less than a year later in um, uh, May of 1896. That tornado actually, uh, the path of that tornado actually started in Iowa, traveled all the way across um, Northern Illinois um, and finally uh, disappeared um, some, some uh, distance east of Elgin. So the, the building was destroyed to the ground. Uh, so they, they, rebuilt, um, they rebuilt the building, uh, but they weren't or, uh, able to keep up with um, borders for, for new bikes and are, were very quickly on the path to bankruptcy. They, um, uh, the Elgin sewing machine um, and bicycle company made several different models of bikes. Their, their high-end bike for the lofty price of $100 um, was called the Gunning. Um, the president of the company was named Gunning. So it was presumably named after him. Um, but they also made um, uh, kids bikes and uh, tandem bicycles. All three of these companies um, um, 
we travel, we're traveling at this time to uh, trade shows in, in Chicago and in New York, uh, showcasing their bikes. Uh, uh, Yeljin um, Bicycle Company actually had a bike encrusted with jewels um, that was shown. It was a tandem bicycle that was val valued at about $10,000 that they showed um, at some of these trade shows. By the early 1900s, these bicycle manufacturers had, had, all, um, had all quit. However, um, Sears Roebuck and Company uh, purchased the Elgin name. So um, we know, I think, I don't know if the display is still here in the museum, uh, things named Elgin that weren't made in Elgin. Mm -hmm. um, the Elgin name uh, was associated with high quality goods, manufactured goods. And so um, Sears uh, knew that and they, they um, purchased the, um, purchased the name and built uh, a series of bikes, the Elgin Bluebird, the Robin, the Blackhawk, the Freightliner, the Space Liner were uh, Sears exclusives. My dad was telling me um, that he believes he owned a Elgin Bluebird as a kid uh, to do his use on his paper route. Um, Sears used a company called Westfield Manufacturing and Murray of Ohio to produce their bike designs. Um, the bicycles sold before World War II were branded as Elgin. After World War II, it was J.C. Higgins. That was my first bicycle, a JC, red J.C. Higgins. Um, along with bicycles, uh, you need all kinds of accessories and tools, and um, those are also uh, available here in Elgin. So tires, tire repair kits, lubricants, oil, bicycle oil, wood rim cement, to uh, glue the tires to the wood rims. Of course, paint, um, metal polish and locks uh, were all accessories sold in Elgin. These photos um, are actually from a, a bike shop that I believe was on East Chicago Street, kind of at, at the, the lower level before the streets were raised. Um, I, I believe this bike shop was actually, it was on the south side of East Chicago um, in like the 200 block. So uh, during the golden age of cycling, uh, racing also became very popular and um, that uh, spawned the development or the creation of uh, a number of bike clubs in Elgin. And I, um, Jeff White has a wonderful collection of, of buttons uh, for these various bike clubs. They used to trade them um, at races um, and he also actually has a, a, a trophy as well from, I think, the 1934 Elgin to Chicago race. So um, we've had those here in the museum uh, with some other presentations in past years, but a wonderful collection. So uh, in addition to local races uh, involving the, the local clubs, there were also uh, longer races. So there were races that went from Elgin to Aurora and back. Um, and then also races going from Elgin to Chicago and back. So that was about a 60 mile, 60 mile long race. Um, the Elgin and Aurora races took place during the mid 1890s. Um, the Elgin to Chicago races uh, began in 1926 and continued through 1964. Uh, by that time, suburbia was starting to build out and I think there was just too much traffic on the roads to, to uh, safely continue those races. Uh, Governor w William Stratton uh, helicoptered into Elgin uh, for the 34th annual uh, race um, to start the race. I think that was uh, also the year that, um, that the mall, pedestrian mall uh, was being dedicated in downtown Elgin. So it was early, early 60s. So uh, the Elgin Racers um, in the, uh, started in, in a variety of locations. Uh, one of the popular starting places was State Street between Chicago and Highland Avenue. 
Um, the very last race in 1964 started in front of the Elgin National Watch Company and went up Grove Avenue um, and made her way out of town and uh, towards Chicago on, on the race route. Now, uh, this is actually the uh, race program for the 1931 Elgin to Chicago uh, race. That, that program is in the collections here at the museum. Um, uh, these races were handicapped, so you know, based on uh, the ability of, of, of racers, um, the slower riders were given a head start and the fastest, fastest rider was the last to leave. Uh, so I've got a little footage here. So uh, there's a, there's a uh, clutter that I ran across on the internet um, and I, I purchased this collection of photos, but uh, he stitched them together into like a, a, a short video. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, the video shows uh, this race starting on uh, State Street between Chicago and Highland and the east side of Chicago Street in that block looks today almost exactly like it looked then. It was, it was really interesting. And it was a brick street. And uh, you look at the bicycles. These bicycles were single speed bicycles with no, no brakes. So they were basically uh, racing track bikes. And um, uh, so, you know, that's, that's what they rode uh, for 30 miles to Chicago and another 30 miles back to Elgin. So pretty amazing. So racing, um, racing came back to Elgin in the early 2000s. So uh, many of you may recall the Four Bridges races that took place uh, between 2000 and 2002. Uh, generally started uh, on Kimball Street. The start finish was on Kimball Street by uh, what is now Danny on Douglas. Uh, that was followed by the Elgin Cycling Classic. Um, and most of those races uh, followed the, the same route as the Four Bridges races, but there were also some uh, criterion races, which actually took place in the heart of downtown Elgin, um, kind of going around Whiskey Point. And, and it was while the streetscape project was going on downtown. So that, you know, that tight turn at Whiskey Point was uh, a little hair raising, I think, for uh, riders, because there's gravel and debris and, and um, I think there was some, some pretty good crashes there. Um, the Fox River Omnium uh, uh, started in 2015 and went through 2017. Um, that race actually was sponsored by a company called Simet, uh, which is a, a bicycle a wheel manufacturing company that got its start in the basement of a home at Valley Creek subdivision in Elgin. Um, and so uh, Simet uh, sponsored this racing series. There was races uh, on one day uh, in Elgin over adjacent to Lord's Park. And then the next day they moved up to, I believe, Fox River Grove and Cary um, and raced uh, up there. Uh, more recently, um, the uh, Dennis Drews Memorial Race um, has been hosted in the Northeast neighborhood of Elgin. Um, Dennis Drews was, um, uh, lived in Hampshire, but worked for a company here in Elgin and unfortunately was uh, uh, killed in a bike crash um, in, I think, 2016. Um, so in, in honor of Dennis, uh, we brought uh, racing back in his name to Elgin uh, starting in 2017 uh, through 2019. And uh, last year, of course, it was interrupted by COVID, uh, but it's coming back. Uh, this year in 2021, in um, late July, um, it will be a, a shorter course than it has been in past years. Again, a criterium course, so um, there'll be a lot of action. That's, that's the advantage of the short courses. You see the racers often. Um, so they're coming by every few minutes, so uh, it's, it's a lot of fun to watch. And that, again, will be up in the Northeast neighborhood. So it will be actually, I think, be the first major event probably in Elgin uh, post this COVID experience. So. 
trail building. So um, Elgin and the greater Chicagoland area uh, benefit from an increasingly connected network of uh, bicycle trails. Um, the regional trails uh, connect with hundreds of local trails throughout the Chicagoland region and, and local bike routes on the street. Uh, so this uh, network provides many benefits. Uh, we all know that getting outdoors is good for our, both our mental and physical health. Uh, so trail riding um, is, a, is a good match for that. Trails are very inclusive. They're for the most part, free, free to use 24 seven, 365 days a year. Uh, they're great transportation options um, and they provide uh, economic activity. Um, there's a trail out east called the uh, um, Great Allegheny Trail um, in Pennsylvania that goes from Western Maryland up into um, uh, Pennsylvania. That's a multi-million, multi-million dollar economic engine for the communities that are along that trail. Those are the kinds of opportunities we have here. I mean, we don't have revolutionary war, war of 1812, civil war history here uh, like they do. But we've got, we have our own history and we have a lot, a lot of great natural resources uh, that can be enjoyed along these uh, trail networks. Um, there's also lots of studies that show that if you live within proximity to uh, a trail, it probably increases your real estate value. Um, the Illinois Prairie Path. So in, um, in um, the early 1960s, a resident of Wheaton wrote a letter to the Chicago Tribune suggesting that um, a bicycle trail should be built on um, what was a former abandoned railroad right of way. Um, that letter generated tremendous interest and um, um, an association was formed, the Illinois Prairie Path Association was formed. Those chairs built the Illinois Prairie Path system um, and it was the first successful rails to trails project in the United States. That's a, um, that's a point that people involved with developing the Elroy Sparter Trail in Wisconsin debate greatly. They say they're the first, but, but the Illinois Prairie Path Association claims to be the, the first successful rails to trails conversion uh, in the US. It's a 61 mile trail system built by volunteers on the abandoned right of way of the former Aurora Elgin and Chicago Railway. Um, Elgin is the westerly terminus of what's known as the Elgin Wheaton branch of the Illinois Prairie Path. So you can ride, uh, hop on the bike, ride from Elgin on the Prairie Path. And I believe the easter, easterly terminus is Villa Park. Um, so you ride through Wheaton and continue to Villa Park. And then you're on city streets. So um, a friend of mine has used a prairie pass system um, several times in recent years to ride his bicycle from Elgin to Cubs games at Wrigley Field, and White Sox games, um, yeah, whatever the park is called these days. I can't keep up with that. <laughs> Fox River Trail um, was um, um, built in um, the late or early 1980s. So um, in the late 1960s, uh, John K. Langham uh, recruited a group of friends who formed the Fox Path Association. Um, amongst those friends was um, the, the um, owners of the C.H. Woodruff Foundry um, and residents of uh, some residents of Dundee and, and Algonquin. So Langham uh, was an internationally acclaimed economist. Um, he testified um, at hearings with the Federal Reserve back in the 1960s during the Nixon administration. He was a planning junkie. I remember uh, seeing a memo that he wrote, a um, copy of a memo at, and some files at, at the city, at city of Elgin. Um, and it was like a five page memo written back in the mid 1950s 
recommending that Bart Nashman be hired to write the 1957 uh, plan of Elgin. So he, he was the chair of the Elgin Planning Commission for, for a very long time, probably not as long as our last chair, Bob Solestone, but a long time. So he loved planning, uh, but he also loved nature. He was very involved in, in um, protecting the Great Lakes uh, and he lived near the Fox River. So he was really interested in doing something with an abandoned railroad right of way um, uh, owned by the Northwestern Railroad um, between Elgin and Algonquin. Um, that dream uh, became a reality in not the 1070s, the 1970s, <laughs> along with uh, uh, the development of uh, a 10 mile, 10 mile long Fox path uh, between Elgin and Algonquin. Uh, uh, so, you know, anybody who has had uh, any involvement in here in the museum in the, in the past will remember Sue Langham. Um, I think, I believe she was his second wife and she was a very active uh, volunteer uh, here at the museum and with the Historical Society. So John Langham uh, was invited in 1971 to give a presentation on their trail building effort um, at a planning conference. Um, and at that conference, he had challenged the attendees to do to go to greater lengths to do, to protect the Fox River corridor and its natural beauty. At that conference was Phil Elstrom. At the time he was a resident of Batavia and, and he and another, uh, a few other Batavia residents um, were very interested um, and uh, um, kind of influenced by, uh, by John's challenge. So uh, years later, uh, Phil Elstrom was elected to the Kane County Board and he became the chair of the Kane County Forest Preserve Commission. And it was at that time uh, that the commission kind of took over uh, the task of building out uh, the Fox River Trail Network as we know it today. Uh, it's a 38 plus mile long trail um, further south. Um, it actually is on both sides of the river. Um, it connects 13 towns, um, it connects 12 other trails, and I believe it um, connects 17 Kane County Forest Preserves along its, along its lengths. Um, so it's a great asset uh, to Elgin and to the communities along the corridor and to Kane County and Northern Kendall County. So um, in more recent years, uh, bicycle advocacy um, um, has become more popular. In, and in Elgin in the 1970s, uh, there was an organization called the Elgin Spok Spokesman Bicycle Club. I wish Dan Miller was here because uh, he shared with me uh, some files that he had from uh, that time frame. Um, that have maps of, of the bike routes and things that, uh, that they rode, but he would bring his um, high school, uh, at the high school that he taught at, he formed a bicycle club and he would bring the kids to Elgin uh, to go on these rides. So, and they were long rides. They would ride east to, or west to Galena. They'd ride up to Lake Geneva. They were all over the place in uh, Northwestern, and uh, Northern Illinois and Wisconsin on, on these rides. So there were tremendous rides that uh, actually attracted hundreds of, of bicyclists. So they generally, this generally lasted through the 1970s. I um, gave a presentation to the um, Fox Valley Bike and Ski Club in, in Geneva a few years ago. And there was a gentleman there, an older gentleman, um, and he had a, uh, like a nylon windbreaker that was covered with embroidered patches that were from these rides. Um, it was wallpapered with, with patches. So, um, so these rides uh, typically started in either Lords Park or Wing Park, depending on uh, you know, what the destination was um, once they got out of Belgium. 
Um, and they were led, uh, the Ocean Police Department uh, facilitated a rise. So they kind of escorted the, the large groups of riders out to the edge of the city and then they were, they were on their way. Um, wish I had been in Ocean 10 years earlier. I think that would have been a lot of fun. I talked to Dan about, um, so it'd be fun to retrace those, some of those routes, but he said, you know, traffic was a lot different in those days, so. Um, so uh, one, of the, one of the newest uh, organizations that has um, started in Elgin is Elgin Community Bikes. And I, I serve on the board of this newly formed uh, not-for-profit organization in Elgin, um, which was um, started in 2018. And this last year, um, in June and July of uh, 2020, um, we opened up our bike shop in downtown Elgin. Um, and it's, I can tell you, it's been a tremendous success. Um, there are no new bikes sold at this bike shop, but uh, they we take donation bikes, we refurbish those bikes and return those to the community. And it's basically is a pay as you can uh, type of business. So uh, we're not looking to make a huge profit that, you know, if you can only afford to pay five, five bucks for a used bike, you know, that's, that's the price. If you can afford to pay $30, which is probably what it should go for, uh, you know, that's the price. Um, so uh, the Elgin community, Elgin community Bikes advocates using the bicycle to meet your city and neighbors, believing riding bicycles can make Elgin a happier, healthier, and more equitable community. So I invite you all to come ride with us. We have a full moon ride coming up uh, in about a week. So uh, last month, our full moon ride, which uh, they're about seven to eight mile long rides, very slow, comfortable pace. Start, starts at nine o'clock at night in the, uh, what I call the Crocker Theater parking lot uh, across from the bike shop on South Grove. Um, but uh, last month, I think we had about 70 people uh, on that ride. And I, I can tell you that, you know, so this is starting at nine o'clock, it's dark. Um, and I can tell you that seeing 70 bicycles coming down the hill on Highland Avenue back to the river is a pretty cool sight. Drivers on the road, are they, they, they look, they see all those little headlights flashing and, and some taillights, they go, what in the heck is coming at us? <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's quite an experience. So, um, so uh, with that, um, that kind of wraps up my program. Um, there are a lot of people uh, that have helped me put this together over the years. So number one, the Ocean Area Historical Society and Liz. Um, the Historical Society has some really nice collections of bicycle memorabilia here. Some of the um, catalogs uh, from, from those uh, bicycle manufacturers back in the 1890s, which are really interesting to look at. Um, Mike Elft, of course, um, he talks about uh, the bicycle manufacturers and racing and, and his books. Lucy Elliott kind of got me started. She was, she was the one who initiated uh, my interest. And she said, you, sh you should do a program on the history of biking in Elgin. So she kind of, she kind of pushed me into this. Of course, Jeffrey White, um, you just got, I think, I think, you know, between Jeff White, Dennis Roxworthy, Dennis, um, Steve Thorne, I think those three um, have the uh, next largest museum collections to the Elgin Area Historical Society in Elgin. So, uh, so Jeff, Steve Thorne, and Dennis Roxworthy uh, have all, all contributed to these programs um, in the past. Um, Dennis, I don't know, you still own that uh, Elgin bike? I yeah. do. That, yeah. That, is a, that is a Columbia. Okay. It was made by Columbia. Yeah. 1941. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this bike, uh, I, I've never seen a bike in such perfect condition. Yeah. Uh, it's got the original tires on it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Steve Thorne has a bike that 
I'm guessing probably date, could date back to the late 1800s or very early 1900s, and it looks like it's that old. It's really worn, but it is also a very, very cool machine. Um, so, and of course, Dan Miller, um, uh, you know, he, he went on uh, these rides uh, sponsored by the Elson spokesman. So he, he has uh, a collection of uh, treasures from those trips. And Jerry Turnquist, Jerry Turnquist in his uh, history columns for a local paper uh, wrote uh, oftentimes about, especially about uh, racing in Elgin. Uh, Parker Thompson, um, he's a founder of Elgin Community Bikes and the inspiration behind that organization and a critical past. Critical past um, is the owner of the photographs and the little film that I tried to show you, but, uh, uh, but they, they deserve credit. So uh, I think all of you that have helped me on these programs um, in the past years and um, bike on. So, so I always say a bike walk move, it's good for the mind, body and soul. Thank you. Those are highly collectible now. So basically, from from the early 1900s, um, you know, with the advent of the motorcycle and the automobile, bicycle kind of fell out of fashion. But um, they were a popular kid display, basically, mm -hmm. up until the early 1960s when uh, the ten speed bicycle uh, came out again, and people started getting adults started getting more interested in cycling. But those in the intervening years, um, the bicycles, uh, or for example, the bicycle that was shown on that Sears ad, they were they were designed to look like motorcycles. Right. So they were like so. It was, you know, basically, a, it's a kid's toy. The kids imagine that they're riding a motorcycle, so it would look like a gas tank. Mm -hmm. uh, and a big round headlight mm -hmm. on the front of it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. um, so, yes? Well, Jeff and I have two Elgin bikes with male and female. And yeah. these things are so darn heavy. Yeah, I, I used to ride it to school uh, 20 mm -hmm. years ago, and I just got so worn out. I mean, they just had the pedal brake, you know, no speed. Right. Man, those things. Yeah. So, um, I'm guessing, uh, so do you have an idea of what year those um, bikes might have been manufactured? I think like 30 it says out on it, so yeah. it pretty cool too. Right, right. right. So, yeah. so those bikes are probably sold through Sears using yeah. 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 Um, when did the key, wow. when did the bar come off for girls? That was, that was, um, that was back in the golden age of cycling when the safety bicycle came out. And so, um, so, um, one characteristic of the safety bicycle is what's called a diamond frame. And bicycles today, uh, this, is, this is my new bicycle, um, they basically look very similar design wise to what was built in the late 1800s. So, this, this is what's called a diamond frame. Mm -hmm. um, that was characteristic of the safety bicycles. But for the ladies, um, they removed the top bar and kind of beefed up yeah. um, you know, the, bottom, the bottom of the bike. Yeah. Um, so today, they don't call those ladies bicycles anymore. They're called step-through frames. And, um, you know, old guys like me, sometimes it, it gets hard to, <laughs> to throw that leg over a, a saddle and get on the bike. So, um, so they mark it. It, it, you know, market it to, to anyone who wants to ride a step through. Yeah. Um, Everyone needs to put skirt, skirt in the room. Yeah, so, yeah, so the ladies' bikes um, uh, oftentimes also had skirt guards. So uh, the rear wheel, it, it had a guard. So sometimes it looked kind of like focused, other times it was a solid piece of metal mm -hmm. that kind of covered the rear wheel. Um, then the chain guard. Um, and that was to keep keep the ladies' uh, clothing from getting wrapped up 
wrapped up in the wheel or, or the chain. Sprocket. So it's really interesting that the ladies out on bicycles are not nearly as collectible as the men's bicycles. You know, the collectors are, are interested in men's bicycles and the ladies mm -hmm. do not bring the money to the uh, Yeah. So uh, when they were uh, the ultra bicycle manufacturers, I'm sure this was the case across the country and around the world with bicycle manufacturers. Uh, Tandem bikes, um, some, some manufactured tandem bikes were uh, a front seat and handlebars. It was basically a step through design so that the lady, if she wanted, could take the lead um, and, and ride the bike. And the gentleman would just be sitting in the back oh, hoping to uh, <laughs> provide power. <laughs> Yes. I wanted to tell you about my first bicycle it's in the 1950s. It was a hop along castle bike. Uh, that was my favorite cowboy. Mm -hmm. Black bike, hop along castle be on it. I had two holsters for my cap guns. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's when I wanted to ride no man so the <laughs> I wish I had that, but I don't know who made it or anything. Yeah. My parents probably picked it up for a couple of bucks I can hand somewhere yeah. else. I bet, you, money. I bet you if you Google that, you find some information about that bicycle. $5,900? <laughs> <laughs> what do they mean? Schwing was big and mean. Put the car names on bicycles, the Corvette. Right. Yes. Yeah. And a lot of bikes back in the fifties, actually the forties, they would put tanks and fenders and make them like a car. Yeah. 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 Um, there's, there's, I mean, there's so many different um, interesting bikes. Mm -hmm. I, I recently saw a picture, um, an older photo uh, from my hometown, and I actually saw one of these bikes at, at a wedding that we went to over. Most part of oh, it was, uh, it was a tandem bicycle, but instead of having one seat behind the other, it basically looked like two bicycles side by side and were perfectly attached to each other. And so this, uh, this couple got married. Uh, they're both big in the cycling. Um, they rode off after the wedding ceremony on their bicycle and came back. But Ten minutes later for the reception, but it was pretty interesting to see. Um, what do you think about these uh, new motorized bicycles that they seem to be becoming very popular? Um, I think they're great. Um, I don't think there's that, no pedaling involved, I don't think. Or would, well, some of them do. Yeah, yeah. So there's, uh, yeah, there's different. Um, I guess different grades of these um, electric bikes, and uh, we were over in Germany uh, traveling a couple of years ago, and we were um, at the uh, confluence of the uh, Rhine and Moselle rivers, and we rented some bikes. And uh, I can tell you that more people have e-bikes over there than don't. Uh, they become just incredibly popular in Europe, especially when you're a river community like these, uh, like along the Rhine and Moselle rivers, because uh, I mean, we think we've got um, a big valley here in the Fox River. It's nothing compared to the valleys that those people live in. So um, I, um, uh, they're, they're fantastic. One of these I'm probably going to own one. I'm not ready for that yet. But. <laughs> Remember the wizard? Hmm? Remember the wizard? Yeah. The swing with a gas motor on it? Yeah. And, um, I've seen, uh, I've seen yeah. a couple of motorized bikes around oh, Belgium, very right. often not. But uh, yeah. So this bike actually, uh, this bike actually has a future. This bike has electric shifting. So wow. there are no cables between the uh, shifter and the uh, derailleur. <laughs> they talk to each other. And uh, so it, it drops precisely into the next gear uh, when, you hit, when you hit the shifter. What's that bike weight? 
Uh, it's a free lake. Actually, it's it's uh, it's uh, it is pretty light, but it's it's heavier than a lot of road bikes. This is what's called a drench road bike, so it's really uh, built for comfort and for long rides, not really racing. Mm -hmm. uh, I I'm not a racer. I don't have the legs for that, but uh, uh, so it, it also has disc brakes, so they can handle like lighter tires, mm -hmm. so it's a cushier feel on the road. Uh, so uh, Ultra Community Bikes, the next full moon ride is, I think, May 28th or 29th, something like that. Thanks, please. 26? Yeah. Um, so we start um, we start on South Grove Avenue in the uh, you know, old parking or in the parking lot next to where the Crocker Theater used to stand. And that's a lot of fun. Very time you want to come out and join us. Do you have to register in advance? Do you need to register? No, in advance? Um, no. Um, uh, the only thing you need to do is um, you know, with, with 501c3 and insurance came a requirement to sign a waiver form, mm -hmm. and uh, that can be done. Uh, there's a link to do that electronically, uh, it automatically goes into the Elgin Community Bikes um, site. So, you know, Parker, he, he knows who's, who's been the shirt and that registration, um, that waiver last for the entire year. So you just need to do it once and they're covered uh, for the entire year. But each year it needs to be renewed. Uh, and it's a it's a dot org just so everybody knows it's Elgin Community Bikes dot org. Yeah. Is where you can find it. So um uh, Parker Thompson um a couple of years ago uh, went out to Portland, Oregon and went through a, I took a three week long bike mechanic certification course. So he's, he's a certified or some people say certifiable bike mechanic. <laughs> but, uh, uh, he's very good. Uh, so we, uh, we have the capability to tune up bikes down there, uh, tear bikes apart and reassemble them, add things to them, subtract things from them. You just want anything you need. So um, then we get we get donation bikes, and that's what we kind of repurpose and get back out to the community. Uh, the challenge we have there is a very small space, so sometimes we get overwhelmed with the number of donation bikes that are, are brought in. So if anybody has ideas for some inexpensive storage space <laughs> to, uh, to store bikes, that would be appreciated as well. Uh, I love the idea that it's nonprofit. Yeah, profit bike store. Never heard of a you know nonprofit any store. I know. It's always yeah. owned by somebody. The owner makes right. money. Right. So, so um, yeah. So you know, uh, we order new parts, or replacement parts, and things, and, and accessories like water bottles, and locks, and lights, and bells, and you know, all those come from. Uh, distributors, wholesale distributors, and so those items you have to sell at the price that the distributor. Yeah, but it sets. doesn't. It's not like it's Parker Store, so it's, right. It's all it, you know. It's, it's a community. There's a community right. board that that, right. that runs it with Parker, paying right. Parker, or right. something. Yeah, and then so, um, getting yeah. volunteers to do yeah. work and mm -hmm. making donations. Yeah. I think it's wonderful. Yeah. So there, there's a number of similar operations in, right. in the area. Um, there's a couple of businesses um, in Chicago. Uh, West Town Bikes is, is kind of what our stores model after. Um, and uh, they, have, they have two locations in Chicago, but um, I think that they do what I think Elgin Community Bikes would love to do sometime. They, they mentor several hundred kids every year um, tearing apart, putting back together a bicycle, and kids get to keep that bicycle so they learn a skill um, uh, that they can carry with them. And uh, spent a uh, great success in Chicago. Um, I think, hey, Tom, have you ever been to the Blue Moon Bike Store in St. Mark? Yes. Isn't that fabulous? Yeah. yeah. 
I'm not sure if you were told me there was there was a uh, there's a bike shop in Chicago. Um, Dan Miller might have told me about it. There's a bike shop in Chicago uh, with the owner. He has a, uh, just a fantastic collection of, of old bikes, but he also has um, a lot of memorabilia from this out of the Chicago bike race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty pretty interesting place. I need to track Dan down and find out where that's at. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everybody for coming today.